What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Brandon's Face. It's the podcast about a playlist. I'm Jonathan Beardsley. And I am Brandon May. We hope you're all doing well. The lineup for Coachella 2025 was just released like an hour or two ago, so we are going to start off by going through that. Let's start off with Friday, man. It is headlined by Lady Gaga this year. Actually, let's just start off with the headliners in general. They were confirmed, I think, as early as yesterday. They're Lady Gaga, Green Day, Post Malone, and Travis Scott, who I believe will be an appendage to Saturday. What do you think yes. of the headliners? I think Lady Gaga is a solid headliner. I think Green Day can put on a fantastic show. I have yet to see them live. I've seen uh, many a video online and heard many a testimony saying that they can do it. Uh, I'm not a gigantic fan of Post Malone's live shows from my understanding at the very least, but... I will say that I did like his last album, and I'm uh, he's he's a genuine guilty pleasure for me. Uh, Travis Scott will bring the worst fan base on the entire planet to my neck of the woods in April of 2025, and I'm not excited for that. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Post Malone, that last album you're speaking of, F1 Trillion, notably a country album. Why is he not playing the country music festival that takes place the week after Stagecoach or after Coachella? Uh, I believe TMZ reported that Post Malone will be playing a hybrid set uh, with a, a few songs off of F1 Trillion, but the majority sure. of his hits, which he is known for in the pop, question mark, realm of things. Sure. All, all genres at this point. Yeah, he's he's also going on tour, which I think would probably interfere with those follow up dates. Uh, it's it's an interesting group. It, it does not entice me at all. It does not give me any FOMO. Let's dig into the undercards for each day, though. I'll just go kind of off the ones I know we know. Uh, Friday, we got Missy Elliott, the Marias with very high placement, Lisa from Blackpink, the Prodigy, Parcels, FKA Twigs, Mustard, Malpee, Glorilla, Yeet, Marina, Tyla, uh, we got Mike Snow, 3-6 Mafia, Chris Lorenzo, St. John's, 4 Bats, Vintage Culture, I Dress, A.G. Cook, Lola Young, Tin Liquor, Pete Tong, few more on there. What do you think of Friday? So, a couple of things. Number one, you skipped right past the Go-Go's, which I apparently did. is a, uh, uh, a pretty big get. I didn't know that they still played here. Uh, around anywhere um and then i believe mm -hmm. uh sarah landry who i don't think we've talked about a lot on the podcast but has gotten quite a bit of uh buzz for her hard techno mixed with pop music samples and damien lazarus should be mm -hmm. pretty interesting lola young i don't think you said uh, i did, you did i did I'm say sorry. lola okay. and tim liquor tim I liquor left a few out i was just hitting the highlights Tin Liquor does not have live next to it, which begs me to believe that it's going to be a DJ set, probably in the Yuma tent, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But I would have preferred a later placement or a higher placement on the post on, on the poster with their live sticker right next to them. Overall, Friday is pretty is pretty stacked, bro. I'm not going to lie. I think Friday is okay. My must-see for Friday is the Marias. Who would have guessed that? Uh, who's your must-see <laughs> for Friday? If I were going, uh, straight up Missy Elliott, bro. Yeah, uh, that's not a bad pick either. All right, digging into the undercard of Saturday, we got Charlie XCX, the original Misfits. And can we just sidetrack here? Are they the first people to ever get Coachella to allow their original band font to be on the flyer? Oh, shit. How did I not notice that there is a different font here? Yes, I think they might be. I, I think they are, and that, that, that's a hell of an accomplishment. So shout out the Misfits. I think even just seeing this kind of lets us know how much cooler this would look if everybody was logos. But then you, right. you, you kind of get into ultra territory where it's a lot more squinting than anything. So I get right. it. Um, all right, Charlie, the Misfits, Above and Beyond, Anita... Claro and Hyphen filling out the K-pop for Saturday. T-Pain, that should be a lot of fun. Japanese Breakfast, Beth Gibbons of Portishead. Uh, Dark Side, we got Jimmy Eat World, the Viagra Boys, Disco Lines, Blonde Redhead, A-Lock, some, uh, some Deep House, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Salute, 
a few more Leighton Giordani um, infected mushroom who are not only Coachella mussies, but Coachella veterans. I think it's cool to see them on here again. There, point out some that I missed and also just what your th- overall thoughts on Saturday are. Okay, number one, the trance representation with Above and Beyond is amazing. People have been begging for Above and Beyond or Armin or Cosmic Gate to play at Coachella for like a long time. And I am so glad that trans heads finally get some representation at this festival. Uh, Kind music is gigantic right now. Um, As you can tell by number one, they're booking, but I, I, I have yet to see their live shows. I have a, I have a buddy that has gone and seen kind music a a number of times and, and they say that it's going to be very good. Interesting. Uh, the Gustavo Dudamel with the Los Angeles Philharmonic is something that you missed. It's the L.A. Phil is how it's billed, but I am very curious about that. I'm going to go ahead and assume that they get some more somewhere towards a sunset spot for that. They're just called and the Phil now. That's fucking cool. I, I guess, man. I guess. Uh, Ameli Lenz is going to just crush yeah. the Yuma tent unless they give her a Mojave uh, set time. And I think that's, I mean, there's a number of things that we didn't, that, that, that you didn't talk about. Leighton Giordani has been playing some boo boo house lately, but in, in less so techno, but he'll be a fun time in the Yuma. It's uh Saturday is probably the most stacked day of the, of the bunch. If you ask me, man. Yeah. You got LCD sounds. Oh, sorry. It says the dare. Uh, we got the dare <laughs> down there on Saturday. So that, that's a big get as well. Um, <laughs> Sorry, had to. Uh, all right, Sunday, the the day most. Uh, let's not forget Travis Scott will be on that Saturday up there with Green <laughs> yes, Day as well. Yes, that's true. How the staging for that will work, who knows? Um, all right, Sunday, Post Malone's the headliner. We got Megan the Stallion. Hottie Cella is happening. I think that's going to be a really really fun show. Uh, Zed Jenny from Blackpink. I think that's interesting considering Rose has an album dropping. Next month, Lisa, who's on Friday, has an album dropping in February. Jenny does not have an album dropping, so I find her placement on this festival interesting. It could lead into my theory that I dropped a few weeks back that all of the Blackpink girls are going to drop solo albums this upcoming year. We'll be surprised if that didn't happen. Yeah, me too at this point. Uh, Kraftwerk, Biba Doobie, Polo and Pan, XG, another k-pop group we're big fans of basement jacks love seeing oh my that god um chase and status that's gonna be a lot of fun we got arca huge get shibuzi another one uh they might be playing stagecoach as well i'm not not really sure about that but some country on the day with post malone we got Ty Dolla Sign, Circle Jerks, interesting. The Am- Circle <laughs> Jerks, John. Yeah, I shouldn't just gloss over that. Circle Jerks are playing Coachella. That's fucking weird. Uh, Amel and the Sniffers, Sunday. That should be fun. Boris Brecca, that's going to be a great one. He just played, what, two years ago? Yep. Uh, Money Long, Amaray. I will not shut up about Amaray, Brandon. I know you um, won't. <laughs> we got The Beaches, who I think are honestly too low on here, as well as Soft Play, who I think are kind of a must-see. Uh, gel, gel as well. We got some, we got some hardcore on Sunday of yeah, Coachella. Right? What the fuck? Uh, probably early in the day hardcore too, which might be the best. Uh, what are your thoughts on Sunday? My thoughts on Sunday is that, is that you skipped right over ginger root and that's just rude. I'm sorry. But... I'll go straight to jail right now. <laughs> uh, gel getting on the lineup, uh, on the same day as the circle jerks and ammo and the sniffers is, really just it's got to be playing on the same stage as the circle jerks has got to be a fun time for them you know i would imagine that circle jerks will be playing or closing rather the sonora tent i'd be surprised if it was anything but that soft play as well that should be fun yeah man sunday sunday is gonna be a a nice uh, a nice time to smoke some weed and hit the mosh pits What do you think about the time of year for the release? This is unlike anything they've ever done. We typically get this in January, so this is very early, late November. This is the first time that we've ever gotten anything in November. 
uh, for the festival being held in April. As hardcore Coachella people may know, the original festival was held in October uh, in 1999. But every festival since then has been held in April, and the lineup has dropped in either January or February. I do not believe it's ever dropped in uh, December or November. I think that they had some trouble moving tickets last year. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is going to help them move some tickets. Those are my thoughts on it. I'm glad that they got everybody locked in, and I'm glad that... Everybody that is locked in can also announce their tours, Yep. Uh, which is how this kind of came about. Yesterday, Post Malone posted their tour. Somebody commented, is this kinda a Coachella leak? Yep. Yeah, and I guess Post Malone's manager replied to that comment like, it's not a leak if I fucking dropped it. So, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I feel but, like he was given permission to put that out. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the Travis Scott fans. If you come to our desert, please... Please, please take care of it. Be good. Uh, be good. Uh, guests. Don't be the angry old man. Just like get off my lawn. They'll, they'll be fine. You'll be OK. The desert has survived much worse than Travis Scott fans. They've survived Travis Scott fans before. But I'm just saying, man, let me be an angry old man for like a okay. second. Okay. OK, you do have a lawn or you do have a house. You are a homeowner. You can be the angry old homeowner in the desert considering you live so close so you can complain my lawn about might be that. plastic but i have a lawn <laughs> let me scream at clouds okay sir you got turf like the fucking brady bunch over there man i love it um all right my final thoughts on it are i don't love the overall lineup i think there's some gems as always um I do like the earlier release of the lineup. I think if we could eventually get to a place where the tickets go on sale at the same time as the lineup, that would be ideal. But I think moving towards a place where not only fans have more time to consider these financial decisions that are kind of huge at this point, and whether or not they want to go based on the artist performing, not just the hype around being at the event itself... And the artists can actually announce their tours around these times without all of that kind of holding up the industry through winter and kind of making it just a dead month in the music industry in terms of news as well as releases. I think this should help with all of that. So overall, I'm a fan of the progress. We will dive more into the Coachella lineup when they do release set times in a few months. But yeah, it's interesting. We'll see what new developments take place until then, though. Yes, sir. All right. Starting off this week, we got a new one from Party Favor, Wheaton, Katie Tiz. It's called Party. This is not my song of the week, but it probably should be due to how much I've listened to it, man. All the twists and turns in this one are so fun. Bringing back that, like, I is this dubstep? Is it just kind of dubby bass house? Whatever it Future is, man, bass. I am loving this. Future bass. There we go. Uh, I've, I've never like really listened to any of these artists a ton. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing one of their names right, but love this song. <laughs> what about you? I had a lot of fun with this song, man. Really fun, really bassy. I loved this one. It was a great way to start things off. Um, most definitely. We got a new one from Pasa and the adventures of Stevie V dirty cash money talks. We have not talked about Pasa on the podcast as far as I can remember. I like some of his more rele- recent releases. This is this is okay. I think that the lead vocal is great, but it kind of deserves better than these generic tech drums and that whatever rap verse in the middle that feels straight out of like the Michael Jackson 80s. What did you think of this one? Did it do more for you? I mean, I like the little wiggly bass line, but other than that, that was basically all I enjoyed from this one. Have you listened to Pasa before? No, no, I have not. Uh, I will definitely throw some of his better cuts on, like, the best of EDM for the year, so you can dive into those when we get around to that. Sounds good. Uh, new one from Flight Facilities and Drama, Dancing on My Own. This is the second collab of theirs we've talked about, I think, this year, and both have been pure magic. The bass line is undeniable on this one, man. What are your thoughts? Yeah, same. That bass line is crazy, as is tradition for a Flight Facilities drama collab this is an extremely euphoric house banger they just get it man um new one from salute and jesse Ware, heaven in your arms uh just we are witnessing salute 
kind of becoming Disclosure Jr. right in front of our eyes right now, man. Yep. It's uh, it's pretty great, though. I really like this track. What about you? Yeah, I, uh, I'm actually really happy that they got on the Coachella lineup so everybody who streams the festival will be able to see. Jesse sounds great on this. Salute mm-hmm. killed the production. I'm a big fan of this one, man. Same. Uh, new one from Inglehart. It's Small Steps. What are your thoughts on it? Look, man, I know that we like just covered a Tim Englehart track last week or a remix of his last week. Uh, this track was too good to not add. He's got this fair. very specific vibe and it crushes it all the way through. That's fair, man. Uh, yeah, as always, just the chords and the synths are perfect on this one. It's really, really well done. Uh, and remixes and originals are different, so you're not we're not doubling down too much here. All right, we got a new one from Duke DeMont and Panama called All My Life. Feels like Duke is starting to go full Swedish house with this one, man. What are your thoughts on it? My notes literally just say, the Duke. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> uh, new one from Joris Vorn and Jan Blomquist, Flora. Any thoughts on this one? Joris and Jan on the same fucking track, bro. This whole thing rules. People who are worried about pronouncing J's are sweating seeing this collaboration, man. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I actually had trouble getting into this one, which is not usually the case for the names attached to this song. I don't know what it is. Hasn't really clicked yet. Definitely didn't dislike or skip, but didn't really hit me as hard as I thought it would for them. It's fair, man. Maybe, maybe you like their solo productions rather than their collaborations. That could be it. Uh, Got a new one from Mala. Get Hyped is the name of it. It's fun on the first listen, but not very memorable in my opinion, which is kind of just Mala in a nutshell. (laughs) What do you think of this one? Thank you. That is exactly how I felt. The first time this song came on, I was like, oh, this is a banger. Who is this? And then I looked at it, I was like, oh, of course it's Mala. And then every other time it came on, I was like, yeah, this is Mala. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Uh, We got this Feed Me remix, Happier By Now. It's by Kai Wachi. What are your thoughts on it? You know, man, Feed Me always just such a good job with his remixes because he only injects like just enough of his personality for you to like tell that it's a Feed Me remix, but also complements and retains as much of the original production as well as he possibly can. This remix is no different. I really liked this one. Ugh, don't hate me, man. Uh, I, I don't think Feed Me is the issue with me for this one. I just don't like the vocals. Like, this vocal style with EDM just is not doing it for me lately. I think That's the fair. music and the Feed Me elements are great. But like you said, he kind of keeps all of that intact on this. And I feel like I wish he would have distorted it or mixed it up a little more. Because those original vocals being so prominent are really the only thing I don't like about it. Um, That's fair. I mean, I can't hate you for it. Thank you for not hating me. (laughs) We can move forward as friends now. (laughs) Uh, We got a new one from FKA Twigs and Corliss called Drums of Death. I I know I'm just reading the text here, but the drums on this are fucking excellent, man. Uh, Three for three in the singles. I'm very excited for this album next year. What about you? When I saw the title of this song, I said, we'll see about that to myself (laughs) and then left very, uh, very after listening to the first song, I left it and thinking, oh, my God, they were right. Yep. Yep. Uh, She she lived up, man. All right. We got a new one from Benny. Animal is the name of this one. It's another absolute gem and it's very fun, as is all of her music. Very her. A little more pop rap almost with like her cadence in that first verse i like it man what about you yeah she leaves the uh the bedroom pop sound uh about like mid song and does her kind of like own thing even though this sound kind of was her own thing this is like almost like a departure from what she's been known for and i still love it so same same uh i i think we're due for a an official new album next year from her uh, yeah, I'd and love if, a full project. Yeah, I mean, 2020 was her last one. She put out an EP, I think, in 2022, and it's just been single since. But it's unusual for an artist to get as much like critical acclaim as she got and just kind of uh, streaming success as she got on her first album and not follow it up for another five years. But us Benny fans are sticking around. We, we know it'll be worth the wait. Real. 
Uh, all right, two new songs from BB. I think the first one's pronounced Dere, and we got Burn It featuring Dean. I know she's been doing a lot of acting in Korea, so I wasn't really sure we'd be getting any more new music from her this year. But both of these are outstanding. The video for the first track is a lot of fun. It's doing, I think, bigger numbers than the actual song is on streaming. Her her visual direction is always a lot of fun. And I don't know Dean by name, but kind of seeing the reaction to this online, I guess he does not surface very often and her getting him to come out for a verse is kind of a big deal in like the Korean R&B community. So I like both of these songs. I was not expecting them, but kind of blown away by them. What about you? What did you think of them? I liked both of them. We, these are two very, very different tracks. Uh, the Dean feature was interesting, so I'm glad to know that uh, he's not like a, a, a very uh, – or he's a, he's a pretty big get. I did not know that. I like both of them. I, I, I'm not sure that it's entirely my thing, but I, I liked both of them. I never, I never skipped any of them, you know? The- the second one was definitely more contemporary R&B, almost like American R&B at times, so I could get and like down tempo at that. So I could see why that one wouldn't be for you. The first track's like mid tempo, happy, and I feel like the other two packs she released like back in January or February had a similar duality of sound to it. Um I I kind of right. like that when artists are like Here's not two of the same sounding song, but two different sides of my sound. I think she does that well. We'll see where she goes from here, though. Um, all right, new one from No Guidance. You, One of your favorite R&B groups. This one's called Nostalgic. Is this one hitting for you? Yeah, man, I can't believe that you didn't add this and I did instead. You just beat me I... to it. <laughs> <laughs> man, this whole this group just fucking gets it, bro. Yeah, you already know I love this one, man. Great shit. I um, I think we're due for like a proper full length album from them soon. They've been dabbling in just some EPs for a while now. Um, all right, let's move into the rap realm of things briefly with this new one from Rayvon and Isaiah Rashad called East Chat. Just when I started to give up on Rayvon, he drops this absolute banger with Isaiah to pull me back in. Admittedly, I think a lot of what draws me to it is that intro verse from Isaiah, but I think the whole track is clicking for me. What about you? Yeah, this whole track is fantastic, man. Uh, Both Ray and Isaiah sound great on this one. You couldn't have asked for a better collab. Man, it feels like it's kind of been like a famine, famine, feast thing with TDE. It felt like we went years without a release from almost any artist on the label, and now we're just getting song after song, EP, new album, Uh, I am not complaining, man. I love it, especially if it's going to be of this quality. All right, man. New one from the Porn Crumpets. Another reincarnation. This is some of the sickest shit they've ever put out. Dude, I love this one. What about you? (laughs) Yeah, man. This. I really like this. They uh, they sent a message to their Bandcamp followers that the album is almost done. We'll probably get that in late 2025 after mixing and mastering. If I had to guess... If I had to guess, rather, uh, this track fucking rules, man. Yeah, Follow so up good. for my song of the week, for sure. But I, it's or runner up, rather. Fair. Uh, really, really good. New one from In Angles, Backbone. Love this track. I will leave my thoughts there since the album drops this week in full. But another one, three for three, no doubt on the singles. I imagine you feel the same. I have one word in my notes. That word is riffage. Yep. Uh, I mean, you could use that for all of their songs, man. All of their riffs are just so fucking good, man. Uh, Very, very excited for that album this week. And another project I'm very, very excited for, the new Driveways EP also dropping this week. This is their new song, Surgery, another track that I love, and another project I can't wait to hear in full. What about you? This is my song of the week, John. Surgery by Driveways. They crushed it. There's no other way to say it. I should have guessed that. (laughs) Mine is coming up in a little bit. All right, we got one from Xeno Theory and Dan Tucker called The Call. What are your thoughts on it? This is your song of the week, isn't it? (laughs) Uh, This is some great deathcore on this one, man. Gargling vocals are always welcome. Uh, I just wanted to throw it on because uh, I, I heard it and I said, oh, fuck yeah, out loud. Yeah, this is, is this not sci fi deathcore? It is. It is. Okay. I would I would consider it. I don't think that when this album drops, I will be throwing it on my sci-fi brutal death metal playlist because it's not quite brutal death metal, but it's close. 
Okay, fair enough. I was get that's exactly why I was asking. So thank you for immediately answering my question. I was like, is it worthy of the the sci-fi brutal death metal playlist? Um, I really like this one, man. It was a great track. I'm glad that some people have actually like found that randomly on Spotify. I've shared it like a couple of times on Reddit, but I've got like 30 likes and it's 25 <laughs> plus hours of just sci-fi aliens destroying things. You're giving the people what they want, Brandon. Link that in the show notes. Um, I will. All right. Talk to me about this machine head in flames, lacuna coil and unearth <laughs> song. These scars won't define us. So- so, John, I saw this song and I said, no way this isn't part of like a compilation or something like that. And lo and behold, I was wrong. It is actually a genuine song on Machine Head's upcoming album for 2025. I loved this. I don't know how else to say it. It's it's a lot. It's a lot. But I... <laughs> besides the fact that it's a lot, it's good for what it is. Uh, yeah, I, I will leave you to this one, man. I don't know. I don't think it's as cool as the names attached had me thinking it would be. And I, I'm big on In Flames and Unearth. Not as big on the other two, but not disliking them by any means. But yeah, this one is, like you said, a lot. <laughs> you know, a number of thoughts went through my head. I saw Machine Head and I was like, oh, new album. Wait, In Flames? Lacuna Coil? Unearth? I was like, there's no way they're going to get enough time to actually and they showcase don't. what they do <laughs> and they don't get enough time so i was right there but i did like it for what it is so that's, that's fair man i i don't think it's unlikable but yeah i don't think there's nearly enough keep in mind this song is three and a half minutes that is four full metal bands uh it don't sound <laughs> right. like it all right one ep to talk about this week it's bubble love and ross from friends push me i thought this one was very good it's got some of those light disco house vibes similar to SG Lewis, but like a little more stripped down. All four tracks on here are pretty solid, man. The title track, though, is my favorite of the bunch. What about you? I know. I know. I know, John. This is not techno. It uh, is not. Some, some techno release this week, but I actually felt like not covering techno this week to really showcase this uh, this EP from a group or a DJ that I love, Ross from Friends. We covered uh, his album last year or the year before, one of those, and it stuck with me. This EP, while a collab, really shows off why I love Ross from Friends production so much. The bass is mixed near perfectly. There are some like really cool techie moments, but most of all, man, it's pure modern house music. It is pure house, man, and it gets it. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. it's got these like, like flowery moments and then it gets like deep in the mix and you're just getting it. And then the synth pads come in and kind of just take you away. I I really loved this EP. I think he's releasing another album in December if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not sure about that. So we'll, we'll have to see. Excited. Uh, very excited, man. Yes, I, I did not mind you mixing up the, the no tech note this week. I thought the CP was more than worthy to take the spot. Good. All right, man. We got a few albums to talk about this week. Not too many, but we do have this new Linkin Park one to talk about. And I'm kind of just dying to know your thoughts on it. You know what, man? I liked this album more than I actually thought I was going to. It's not a rehash of hybrid theory or meteora, but more so like an amalgamation of everything that Lincoln park has done with uh, some new added flair to it. I love that they didn't hire a Chester Bennington clone. If they had, it would have most definitely taken away from my opinion, from the aura that, uh, the new band has, The lead single was pretty good. Uh, Cut the Bridge is very like two minutes to midnight era. Heavy as the Crown is like this really synth heavy track. And you can tell that Mike Shinoda is very confident and like happy with playing his synths in a heavy rock band again. Mike is clearly still the leader of this band and his ability to chameleon into another record with a new singer is something to be said, especially one that hit so many hearts as Linkin Park has. They have this like studio talk with Emily and Mike shooting the shit. And then Mike tells her to put her screaming pants on and before casualties starts. And honestly, as corny and 
god awful cheesy as that was, I cannot deny that I really enjoyed that moment and then her screaming into casualty. Uh, Two Faced was actually their final single. We didn't cover it on the podcast because I think it came out on the night we did mm-hmm. last week's record or last week's podcast. I it has this like really new metal kind of drop D tuning to it. I I enjoyed this album for what it is. This album is a new metal record, new face to it, lots of soft moments, which her voice adds to uh, on a number of different moments and doesn't take away from the heavier moments because she is clearly straining her vocals. I, I'd give her I'd give her vocals about an album, maybe two album tours before it starts to fade away with the way she's screaming. I really like this one, man. Uh, rest in peace, Chester Mennington. I'm going to give this uh, about a seven. Uh, Casualty is probably my standout. I liked the heavier moments on this records, on this record more than I liked the softer moments. What did you think about it? I did not like it, unfortunately, man. I just didn't okay. enjoy listening to it. I think, I don't know, man. It music wise, it just sounds kind of like a copy of a copy that's lost some of its layers in the process to me. And I know a lot was made about who they had come in as their new singer and their affiliations to this and that. None of that influenced my my lack of enjoyment when it came to this record. She's not even the issue with the overall sound for me. It all just kind of feels a little soulless to me. Like a lot of bands from the era they come from a lot of the rap rock stuff they do almost felt dated even then, but it had a charm to it because of the era we were in. Now it's just hard for me to take it seriously in this fashion at times. And I'm not saying the whole album is that. I'm not saying it's even unlistenable. It just wasn't enjoyable for me personally for the most part. Like you said, there's some moments like Two-Faced and Casualty where it veers into these heavier zones. And I do think that I enjoyed that bit a good amount more, but this is not one I'll be returning to. I think it's it's fine as like where they're at for the situation they're in. I'm not mad at this record, but no, it's not really for me. I'm going to go four on it. Uh, Two-Faced is my standout, but I'm glad you enjoyed it overall, man. That's fair, man. That's fair. Uh, let's talk about this new Corday one, The Crossroads. I was... Hard on a few of these singles as well. Um, Maybe maybe a little too hard on it. Uh, Mad as Fuck has grown on me in the week since we talked about it. Syrup Sandwiches hasn't, but I don't don't think it's that bad either. Obviously, the singles with Anderson Pack and Lil Wayne are great, but they have Anderson Pack and Lil Wayne on them, so kind of assume that would be the case. I remember liking From a Bird's Eye View when it dropped a few years ago, but I cooled on it pretty fast. A lot of his bars just started sounding corny to me, and there was no standout production to help offset that. I started to warm back up to a sound in the rollout to this album, even though none of it was really hitting the same as his earlier stuff did. I still went in with an open mind, and I was able to enjoy my time with this one more than I wasn't. I think that that first four-track run is really smooth, and has the level of polish I really expect from an album like this at his stage in this career. Things start to oscillate between like Wayne and Ye Worship more in the album cuts as things progress, but he does that sound well, even if we've heard it done better. Speaking of Ye, he does make a rare guest appearance on the track No Bad News and delivers a shockingly coherent verse. Uh, Both appearances from Wayne are great, but it's his verse on Back on the Road that made me stop and run it back. I think I even had to text you when I got onto that one. Um, That stretch from All Alone through Don't Walk Away can kind of be a bit of a slog to get through for me on repeat listens, but there's still some good bars in that run that prevent me from skipping a majority of them. It does suffer a bit from the features outshining the artist at times, but I'm not mad at the end result. I haven't had a lot of time, I haven't had distance away from this one yet, obviously it just came out a week ago, but overall I do think it's a better album than From a Bird's Eye View, even if it gets there by wearing its influences on its sleeve. It's a light 7 for me, and my standout is Back on the Road with Lil Wayne. What did you end up thinking of this one? That was an extremely fair review, man. I was... Only like fairly excited for this one. And I'm actually glad that the singles that he dropped for this project actually buried the lead a little bit 
We got some great soulful numbers along with a few bangers. We've got bars over bars of conscious rapping and rapping about his basically newfound success. Uh, there is a classic case of singles actually representing the album but not fitting within the space until you actually hear the whole record, which we I, we got a handful of times on this album. I remember going through and hearing uh, tracks like uh, Mad as Fuck in the context of the record being like at the top of it and even like syrup sandwiches being towards the back end of it, which made a lot more sense in the context as a, uh, as a record, as an album, right? Mm -hmm. We got not one, but two Lil Wayne features, which is interesting and must've been expensive. Both of which are great. I think Corday is kind of having his moment before his real moment of actual like household recognition. I hope he takes this and runs with it, but I hope that he takes his time with it as well. This is a fun album with some real shit, and I think he did a very good job with it, man. He always surprises me, and this one is no different. I liked it a little bit better than I liked his last album, which, mm -hmm. uh, from a bird's eye view, I don't think that will ever get to my enjoyment level as The Lost Boy. Uh, and if he does, then, you know, I will, uh, I will most definitely be very happy. Uh, this is about a seven for me, like you. Yep. I think my standout is going to be Saturday Mornings with Wayne. I really, really like Good that track. track. Yeah, him and Wayne go well together. I, I think that's my main takeaway from this. Is we, we've always known him and Anderson Pack are really great together. Now we've got one more. Can we talk, though, for a second about how that Kanye verse sounded like it was from the college dropout era? I mean... W was it AI? I don't know. Is it really no. Kanye? Do we know? Is it an old verse? That's no, what I not. think I'm asking. It's, it's not. not. It's brand no. new. Yes. Yeah. That, there's no way okay. it's an old verse. I, I mean, I could be ignorant here, but no, I think it's I think it's new. His voice sounds older. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. All right. Let's talk about this Poppy album, Negative Spaces. I think she has been my song of the week or a part of it three or four times this year. I'm going to make it one more, man. The only question is, what song do I pick here? I, I love a good intro, and Have You Had Enough is a, is a great intro. The breakdown on Nothing is one of my favorites she's done yet. But in terms of the new songs we got, and you already know this, The Center's Falling Out is probably just my favorite. Two and a half minutes of the tenacity she delivers at its maximum is all I want, man. The singles we heard all fit really well into this album, which I wasn't sure would be the case. I don't know if we talked about them all, but the album's turn away from the alt metal meets popcore sound it establishes over the first three songs for more of a direct pop approach for a few tracks. Uh, I was kind of worried about how they would all fit together when I'd heard Crystallized as a single. I just don't know if we'd ever talked about that one. But th they all fit so well, man. We get some, like more direct pop rock stuff as well in the form of the title track and the one that follows it, but everything on here is working for me. I enjoyed the wave of alt metal that we've gotten over the past five years from groups like Bring Me the Horizon, Bad Omen, Sleep Token, and so on, but I think Poppy might be my favorite of all of those right now, and I think that this album is probably my favorite of hers to date. It's a strong eight for me. Uh, maybe even a light nine. We'll see about that. I don't know. I'll give that some time. My standouts on this one are they're all around us and the center's falling out. But this one lived up to my expectations, man. What about you? So uh, as longtime listeners of the podcast will know, we've been talking about Poppy and how much we like her music for like at least two years now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, been a couple of tracks here and there that didn't really resonate with me for whatever reason, but... Most of her music is great. I had the unreal decision this year at a festival to choose between her and one of my favorite bands, Darkest Hour. I chose Darkest Hour, but I have been thinking about that decision a lot this week <laughs> uh, due to how fucking great this record is, man. She rides the line between pop and metal so well here, man. The synth moments are all incorporated so incredibly well into the heavier moments, of which there are plenty on this thing. Her vocals on the pop side are honestly fantastic, and her harsh vocals show incredible range. 
I tracks like Vital stand out to me because of like the melodies on it. Tracks like Push Go stand out because of the electronic production. They're all around us is probably the most metal core track that she's ever put out. And her vocals are just straight up unhinged on this one. That genty riff that just keeps coming back. You could have sworn that it was Periphery that wrote it. And that <laughs> fucking breakdown, man. Whew. The Cost of Giving Up is probably the most poppy song on this album for me. By poppy, I don't mean like pop music, but poppy yes, as the artist's you know, identity. You know. It really encapsulates what she's able to do, fills all the gaps with like wonderful synth leads. There's fantastic vocal melodies and the harsh vocals are fucking great. I love how Halo kind of like leaves us to kind of float on a cloud after this album we just listened to. This is a really, really good record here, man. I loved it. I could not stop listening to it this week. It's an 8 out of 10. My standout for me, though, is Cost of Giving Up. That is really an encapsulation of this entire record. Yeah, I agree with you, man. I'm glad you enjoyed it as well. I have nothing but good things to say about it. Yeah, this is really good, man. I I don't regret seeing Darkest Hour, but if I was... You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I totally get it. I think Darkest Hour just (laughs) announced a new tour today with, like... I think it's uh, Decapitated as the headliner, Darkest Hour, Ex Mortis, maybe... Oh, that's tight. Uh, interesting tour, but yeah, oh, they're going to be tight. on the road again soon. Um, all right, let's talk about this Maxo Cream album, Personification. Look, it's a Maxo album even before the singles dropped. We knew what it was going to sound like. It's his specific brand of Houston trap that we've come to know and love. Nothing more, nothing less. That That could be disappointing to some, but as a fan, I am very happy with this album. His flow is pretty much the same, but it just works over and over again. Intro track is phenomenal. I love when he speeds it up a little bit in the back half of that one. Crack Arrow with Tyler still goes hard as fuck. The beat for Higher Than Ever might go even harder than that one. Uh, Drizzy Draco 2 brings out Trigger Maxo in full and features... Quite possibly my favorite bar on the album, which is, I'm the Crip John Wick, turn the ops to John Doe. A bar that only Maxo could conjure up and deliver with such finesse. We got Talking and Screw with uh, OT, that one still bangs. Trigaman with Denzel as the closer is so good. I still need a little more time with this one before I know it where it ranks in his own discography for me, but... I'm enjoying it as much as the others so far. It's somewhere in that high 7, low 8 range. My standouts are Crack Era, Mo Murda, and Higher Than Ever. What about you, man? That's funny, man. I'm going to disagree with you for like just a second here. Hit me. Uh, I, Mo Murda being the opener actually really bummed me out. It's not a good track for me, man. <laughs> it, the chorus is terrible, and while the beat is great, Maxwell's flow on it is not on this one. Everything else about the record is fucking great, though. Uh, Shit Show quickly turns all of that around for me, and this three-track run of Shit Show, Crack Era, and Street Fraternity is so fucking good, man. Street Street Fraternity especially is just amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get, you know, obviously, like you said, the uh, the Denzel Curry outro, which is fucking great. That talking and screw with. OT is incredible. Maxo Cream to me is is Southern rap at this point, and he's kind of bringing it back, bro. Like it's he's really crushing it. I like the majority of the production on this one. Basically, Maxo, like you said, has essentially the same flow on every track, but crushes every moment that he possibly can on it. And I I, I really enjoy this one. It's a uh, seven to eight. For me, my standout is actually Street Fraternity. That one hit me pretty hard, man. I'm not going to fight you for not liking Mo Murda as an intro, since it is essentially Banana Fana Fofana just as a rap song, but uh, <laughs> it, it's all good, man. I uh, I get it. I get it. Uh, that's fair. All right, let's talk about this Flow album, Access All Areas. This was one of the most highly anticipated R&B debut albums in a while, That's not even just from a personal perspective. There has been a lot of hype around these girls since they debut. These types of high-level girl groups do not come around in America very often. 
their first single a few years ago became an instant hit. Everything they've put out has received similar critical acclaim, even if it hasn't hit the same streaming success. Either way, their talent is undeniable. You might not be into like their style of music, but what they're able to do vocally demands respect. Those fucking harmonies, dude, are you kidding me? All three of them sound capable of being major pop stars on their own. And that might end up being the case one day, which makes them starting their career off like a mini R&B Avengers even more special. Similarities range from Ariana to Destiny's Child, and none of those comparisons seem sacrilegious when you hear them. We heard a lot of these tracks as singles over the past few months. Walk Like This, Fire, Check, Fire, Caught Up, Fire, Title Track, Fire. The new tracks are all fucking great too, man. I like the intro with Cynthia Erivo. That new track, In My Bag with Glorilla, is already a great single. Her guest verse is just always delivered, but that's another conversation. Shoulda, woulda, coulda brings some of those like Aaliyah Timbaland vibes I love so much. This is a great album, great debut, strong eight. I could even see bumping it up in the not-too-distant future. My standouts are Caught Up and In My Bag. What did you think about this one, man? I'm always curious in your taste in R&B. You know, I'm going to echo a lot of what you said with Glorilla being really the only real feature here because Cynthia's feature on the intro is not really one. But like you said, we covered a lot of their singles. I liked every single one of the singles. I liked every single one of the team cuts. It's mm-hmm. it's it's difficult to put into words, man. It it really did feel like a new Destiny's Child was being created in front of my fucking eyes. You know what I yeah. mean? Like yeah. at at forty seven minutes, it's the perfect length for a debut uh, like R and B group album. It is. I, you couldn't have said it better yourself, John. You said the R&B Avengers. These girls have come yeah. to take the entire world by storm. And I think they're gonna, man. I think that anybody who likes R&B is going to be about it. I think that people who don't like R&B aren't going to skip it. And I think that that's really the only like real metric we can put on it. I am so excited to hear what they do in the future. This entire thing was a banger. It was all my tempo, even some of the slower stuff and I I really really enjoyed it. It was a an eight out of ten for me. My standout is probably shoulda woulda coulda. That song is so good. That's a great standout. I'm glad it's you a good picked one, man. such a deep cut and one that I love as well. Yeah, Bro, I, you know I pick deep cuts. Of course, I know you do. You're you're a true fan like that. Uh, yeah, dude, this one is is just insane. Shout out to them. Uh, all right, let's talk about this less than Jake record, Uncharted. This might be an EP, but it was labeled as an album, so I just threw it down here. I rolled my eyes, honestly, when I saw you added a less than Jake album, <laughs> but the second I hit play on it, man, I remembered how much they slap. They were yep. considered Ska Legends 20 years ago, so to still be operating at this level, beyond impressive. Usually as bands like this age, the writing starts to feel forced, But that is not the case with them or this album. It's one of their shorter albums, but I think that's for the best at this stage of their career. Less is more in this case. It's between a six and a seven for me. My standout is Broken Words, obviously. Those fucking horns, man, are so good. (laughs) What about you? What do you think of this one? Look, man, I don't actually don't have a whole lot to say about this one. This is banger after banger of less than Jake. I've seen them live a few times, so I think I'm always going to have a very soft spot for them. Yeah. I think anybody who's ever seen them live is going to be like, oh, new less than Jake. Let's fucking tight because it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, uh, easily one of the better shows of the year. Every time I've gone and seen them, every track on this is just a uh, ska banger, bro. Uh, brand new day, or uh, like you said, broken. Uh, what is it? Broken words. Either of those tracks are yeah are great. It's a seven for me. I loved it. I yeah, love fire, it. fire. Um, all right, we got a new one from Tiny Moving Parts. Deep in the Blue is the name of this album. Did you love this one as well? You know, man, it's funny. They do this Midwest emo gone pop punk sound so incredibly well that it's almost really easy to write off as another tiny moving parts paint by numbers (laughs) record. But 
the craziest part is that it's done so incredibly well that they've kind of taken over this sound and made it their own. The little twinkling guitars paired with great drum breaks and lyrical moments that would rival most of the third wave emo bands that everybody obsesses over. Uh, listen to your favorite songs. Even has like a little emo core breakdown. Uh, this album mm-hmm. is good, dude. Uh, time frame has this like post hardcore feeling to it with the trinkly riffs paired with the scream singing. It just hit so good. I really enjoyed this one. I liked their last album, uh, but this one is a little less so on mm-hmm. on on that scale for me. Mm-hmm. It's really good emo pop punk that doesn't insist upon itself. I think uh, Waterbed Part 2 uh, is a lot of fun, or uh, or even Listen to Your Favorite Songs. Both of those could easily be a, a standout for me. It's a 7. I, I liked it a lot more than I didn't like it, but I didn't love it like I did their last record. I'm kind What'd of the think? same. I'm kind of the same. I'll start with the, the thing I liked the most about this album, and that is like the obvious growth when it comes to the lyrics. Not saying that I enjoy the lyrics on this album more than their previous ones per se, but I can hear the themes that they write and sing about change as they get older, uh, not just as a band, but as people. Uh, that, that type of growth isn't always as obvious to the ear as immediately as it is with this release, especially in this genre. But that's about like the only area of this album that I could latch on to as more positive than their last one, or more positive than expected, I should say. That, and that word, like, expected, plays a big part in my overall feelings on this one. Like you, I love their last album. I enjoyed the singles for this one, but I'd be lying if I said that that overall, like, this one gave me that same feeling that the last one did. They're still more than capable of slamming into some, like, jangly Midwest emo riff that makes me say hell yeah in the blink of an eye. And their random, like, explosions are always welcome, but... I found a lot of like the overall sound and structure of this one to start to feel a little repetitive this time around. And maybe, like you said, maybe they just do it so well that it's easy to write off. That's usually the name of the game with emo and pop punk. But I was hoping they would be able to continue to blow me away, selfishly, I guess. Instead, I'm left with an album that I think is just okay, which is fine. Uh, and only disappointing because of set expectations. But all of that aside, this one's like an easy six for me. My standout is Before I Go, but Time Frame I liked quite a bit as well. Good shit, man. All right, let's cap it off with this The Mosaic Window album. Uh, Sanctum is the name of it. Please give me your thoughts, man. So this was released on one of my favorite, probably my favorite at this point, metal label, Willow Tip Records. This record is a pretty standard death metal release is what I thought when I first uh, clicked on it. I I, I threw this one on, John, because not only were we lacking in some metal this week, but because the short couple of previews I did really indicated how incredible like musicians these guys were a lot of metal bands can do these like tremolo pickings into guitar solos and and have that like kind of be the standard right it's been the standard since the fucking 90s with death metal what really sets this band apart is their drummer the dr- this is some of the best dr- death metal drumming i've heard in like so long dude uh they have this like the, the this this double bass groove into tom hit into like a thousand different symbols into fucking blast beats into like calmness into fucking blast beats and 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 shit like that can be very easily overlooked when you listen to a metal record because it is madness it's chaotic it's it, it's it's this kind of like esoteric understanding of of metal as a whole but god i don't know what i don't know what came over me but after listening to uh black bethlehem i just fucking lost it with this i was like oh my god man these guys fucking know how to do it i don't know if willow tip like specifically curates whoever they sign but goddamn, please keep it coming, Willow Tip Records. Uh, the Mosaic Window has as as easy on my follow list. I'm gonna be diving into their back catalog. I I really, really, really like this one. It's an eight for me. My standout is Black Bethlehem. What did you think? 
Oh man, I thought this was really good. Love the first track. That that part where they start shredding over the blast beat before going into like a southern metal riff and then going back into the blast beat was really, really nice. The fade up on that riff to start the pounding of hooves is great. The groove in that song, it just especially in the back half, is so fucking good, man. It's different, the, right? It it is, it is. It, but the drums, the drums, like you said, especially on Black Bethlehem, are just insane, man. But that whole song rips. Uh, Turabulum starts off with like more of a mellow riff before it kind of picks up steam before turning into one of the more straightforward songs on the album. Ash Like Anvils kind of brings in some atmosphere with, like, that little doomy section in the front half. Night Disease is solid, but, like, another one that feels almost straightforward compared to the rest around it. Shrouded in Pain and Him to, the Sil- Him to Silence the Light. Those both kind of feel like they act as the finale of the album to me. They feel, like, a bit more grandiose, and they let things breathe in a way that some of the other songs don't as much. Uh, both are great, man thought this whole album was really really good solid seven for me my standout is black bethlehem of course that track is so good bro i think i've read black bethlehem back so many times this week like, it's, a, it's so fucking good dude that's that track just rips you know what i love about bands like this john is that, What's that? like you said they have like some straightforward songs these straightforward songs for a band that is so young that has under 2000 listeners as of right now 2000 monthly listeners is insane Mm -hmm. like bands that small didn't get that good this quickly you know what i mean so this is I, i this is a band to watch i think i will agree with that man yeah talent like this is is rare for sure And they definitely deserve a lot more listeners than that. Um, All right. Next week is actually our last new music week before we start on the album of the year series. So be sure to tune in for that. We will be covering some new albums. We got projects from In Angles and Driveways dropping, as well as that new Opeth album that I'm sure you're going to throw on. We'll throw some stuff that we haven't talked about on and wrap things up for 2024 before we move into album of the year stuff. Make sure you're following along with the link in the show notes for our weekly rotating playlist. We update it every Thursday night, and that will let you know what we're going to be covering on each week's episode. You can also find us on Instagram and Reddit. Just search Brandon's Face Pod. We will see y'all next time. Peace.